Well, find 2 Thessalonians, and we've come to the final message in our series, Reassurance for God's Church Under Attack. That's been our series, and I want to keep ever before us this morning that this is an actual letter that Paul wrote to a community of faith. By the way, have you ever studied Paul's missionary journeys? If, you, if your Bible has a map section, you can find it. And usually there are three different color codes, maybe four, if they count his journey to Rome. And those eras go all over that known world uh, from all the way down in Jerusalem, all the way up uh, into Asia Minor and all the way over eventually to Rome, Italy. Paul, you could say, was a guy that got around. Marvin Olasky writes for World Magazine, and he recently explained the connection between travel, writing, and worldview. And many famous authors have been travelers. And he goes back to the 60s, and he talks about an author named Jack Kerouac. I don't know if I said it right, but he wrote a book entitled On the Road, then a few years later, John Steinbeck wrote Travels with Charlie. Then a man named, and get this name, William Least Heat Moon, Heat Moon, wrote Blue Highways, A Journey into America. And then finally, in his article, Larry McMurdy wrote Roads Driving America's Great Highways, and that was published in the year 2000. And I want to just read to you the very, very last of what he says about these travelers who were also authors. What to make of these four road books? Give Kerouac credit for comprehending the meaningless of life without God. His last sentence, by the way, all these are secular books by non-believers, but he says his last sentence of On the Road depicts well the assumptions of an aesthetic worldview. Nobody knows what's going to happen to anybody besides the forlorn rags of growing old. In other words, the aesthetic, just what you see type of worldview. This is all there is. Give Steinbeck credit for being impressed with a biblical presentation, although it did not change his life. In Travels with Charlie, he describes visiting a, quote, John Knox church. Uh, for those of you who may not know, that would be a Church of Scotland church. And for those of you who don't know, that would be a Presbyterian church. And finding prayers, quote, to the point, directing the attention of the Almighty to certain weaknesses and undivine tendencies, I know to be mine and could only suppose were shared by others, end quote. The pastor was not one of our psychiatric priesthood, saying our sins aren't really sins at all, but accidents. That's another quote. William Least Heat Moon offers at various times a base of Native American spiritualism with a sprinkling of Buddhism and some undertones of Christian mysticism. Halfway through his account, he quotes John Le Carre's comment about the journey of death, nothing ever bridged the gulf between the man who went and the man who stayed behind. And then finally, Larry McMurdy went repeatedly on long trips, but often had no destination in mind. As a college undergraduate, he wrote a paper noting his antagonism to organized religion. I am agnostic, he said. I haven't found any indication that he outgrew his bias, the author says. Driving America's great highways became his opiate, his drug. It's a score of years since he wrote Rhodes. I pray that he's learned the score. Well, you see, it's really tempting to think that we can go find the answers to life out on the road. But Paul, however, was not trying to find the answers to life out on the road. He was exporting the answer to life through his travels, none other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. He had never forgotten his encounter one day when he was on a road. He was on a trip. He was headed to persecute Christians on the road to Damascus where he encountered the living Christ. 
traveling to do what he thought was a meaningful uh, thing to do in life, persecute the church. Jesus found Paul and sent him to a certain local in Damascus, and that man's name was Ananias. And there he was waiting to give, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, a blind Saul the seeing eyes of Paul. The Bible says in verse 20 of Acts chapter 9, right after this immediately, he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Paul went on the road again, but with a totally different outlook and a totally different quest. It is this same Paul who wrote early on in his ministry to this church the letters 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And he wrote to reassure them. So tender and so tenacious was Paul, wasn't he? And we feel that in these last words. Read with me 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and let's start back at verse 13. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish or warn him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You say, now, Pastor, you can't get an entire message out of just those verses, can you? Well, I could, but I'm only going to preach half of one today for you. And the title of this message is The Reassurance of Grace. And here, there are three inferences, I believe, that we can confidently make as to how this happens. Here's what I mean by inferences. This is sort of just Paul saying goodbye. This is Paul saying in his words, which are really the words of, as Josh alluded to earlier, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These are the words of God. It's really a way of saying, God bless you. God keep you. God uh, be gracious to you. So what am I going to infer? What can we infer from these last words? Well, I think three things. We can infer some things about the ministry of the Holy Spirit the miracle of Holy Scripture and the message of the second coming. First, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Look back at verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. May I ask you a question? What is biblical peace? Well, I'll say it's so many different things. But first, it has to be peace with God. Earlier, we heard a verse quoted from Romans, the fifth chapter. The very first, verses said, the first verse says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on to explain what that means. Because before a person's saved, he or she is not at peace with God. He or she is at war with God. And sin separates us from God. But because, therefore, because you are justified by faith, that means you've been declared righteous by faith. At that moment, you have peace with God. This is the foundational peace that you have to have in your life. This is the most important peace. But praise God, it doesn't stop there. You see, there's peace from God. And verses that teach this are by the pen of Paul. And they say, and you've heard these, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace that surpasses all comprehension shall comfort your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And then he comes on down there and says, and the God of peace will be with you. So to the Philippians, he says, there's going to be an, uh, an incomprehensible, uh, there's going to be an unexplainable peace when you cast all of your faith upon the Lord and by the way, here's how you're going to really get that, the presence 
of God. The God of peace is going to be with you. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then there's peace with other believers. Paul told the Colossians, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And it had to do with their bond with one another and their conduct and their attitudes toward one another. And then over in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Paul said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the bond of peace. So biblical peace is peace with God. It's peace with your circumstances, as Josh talked about today. Peace is not the absence of trouble in life, but it is peace or trust and confidence in the midst of those trials, knowing that God's using them for good. It's from God and it's with other believers. And then even Romans 12, 18, we won't turn to it, but teaches that we ought to try to be at peace with even unbelievers as much as possible. And what did Jesus say? Blessed are the peacemakers. This is inseparable, church, from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you come up to me, Pastor, I'm just not at peace. And I say, well, I, I, I've got something to help you, but you're not going to need the Holy Spirit. You would leave and go join another church or try to get rid of me one. I mean, you know that it's the presence of God that brings peace. And I want you to think about this question. How do you get it when you need it? How do you get it? What does it take to get it? Well, there's initial faith. We've been justified by faith. Therefore, we have peace with God, Paul said in Romans 5.1. But what about ongoing faith? Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, tell Jesus about it. That's what Paul's saying. Let your request be made known to God. Ongoing faith, seeking the righteousness of God in his kingdom and all these other things will be added unto you, Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6. But look there in 1 Thessalonians back in chapter 3 verse 3. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. God is guarding us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Back in chapter 1, verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. These people were growing. They had a growing faith. And how did they have that? They could not have had it without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is the presence of God. The reality of the supernatural presence of God brings us peace not the absence of turmoil and trouble. Amen? So I think in, in, inferentially here, you look and Paul says, I want the Lord of peace. By the way, the only time that title's used in the whole New Testament, it's usually God of peace. He's saying, look, this is the ruler, the master of peace, the Lord of peace himself. He emphasizes it. God himself give you peace. Sometimes, no, always, always. In some things, no, always, in every way, and that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. There's no peace apart from the presence of God. But then there's the miracle of the Holy Scripture. Look at verse 17. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. You say, well, what's so important about that? Well, it's very clear that Paul used what scholars call an, an amanuensis or a secretary. And that's clearly stated in Romans 16 toward the end of the epistle to the Romans. But in 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Colossians, Philemon, he often indicates, I'm writing this last part. I'm writing the salutation with my own hand. He wanted them to know this is not a false writing. This is not a counterfeit. This is me talking to you. And he would tell Timothy that all Scripture is given by inspiration or is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, 
for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for all good work. You say, but, but Paul, he, he, would, he would talk about the Scripture being the Old Testament. I'm telling you, these apostles at some level knew that they were writing under the authority of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't have everything they wrote. But we have everything that they wrote that God intended us to have. And one of the most interesting verses in all of the Bible, and I'm telling you, it ought to give you incredible confidence in the letters of Paul and Peter and in the New Testament are the words of Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. Listen to what Peter said. He said, as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. By the way, who does his refer to? Well, look back at verse 15. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation is also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him has written to you. And then he says there, people try to twist some things that he said as they do the rest, the rest of the scriptures. Wow. Petron, absolute affirmation of the authority of what Paul wrote as scripture. The miracle book, the Bible, that God gives us a revelation of himself and we can know about Jesus, our need for Jesus, our sin problem, the glorious second coming of Christ and all that we need to know in this life because he supernaturally revealed it to us using human authors but getting written down every word he wanted us to hear and to read and to know without stripping the authors of their personal life experiences without stripping them of their personal styles and their education level. The miracle of holy scripture. Oh, no wonder David said this in Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And then in verse 133, direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. And then in Psalm 119, 165, great peace have those who love your law. Nothing causes them to stumble. Wow. What is the reassurance of grace? It's just, oh, well, be reassured. And we could, you know, you know how many pagan people sing amazing grace? Wow. But what is it? It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's the miracle of Holy Scripture. And then finally, and I'll be finished, it's the message of the second coming. Look at verse 18 of 2 Thessalonians 3. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. I know that last verse says nothing about the second coming. But what was that grace in verse 18? Well, it's the grace that he referred to in Chapter 1, verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the grace that he referred to in verses 10 through 12 of chapter 1. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This letter is about God's grace in their lives until he comes and the grace of God that brings God back for his church in the literal person of Jesus Christ. It's the grace referred to in chapter 2, verse 16. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us, given us an everlasting consolation and good hope by, say it with me, church, grace, by grace. Let me tell you what the reassurance of grace is. It is in part 
the message that God is coming back for us. The Lord Jesus will return. The Lord Jesus is coming for his people. He will right every wrong. He will topple evil. He will set up his kingdom. And then there will be justice on the earth for all. Worry has been defined as, quote, a small trickle of fear that meanders through the mind until it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. Let me say that again. Worry is a small trickle of fear that meanders through the mind until it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. Have you ever felt like you really couldn't focus on anything except your problem? That which you were worrying about? Let me ask you, are you worried? This was a worried church. Are you confused? There was some confusion in this church in Thessalonica. These letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, are for you. God is with you. You need to know God is with you in the presence of the Holy Spirit. His ministry is with you. You ought to be reassured that's His grace in your life. The miracle of the message of Holy Scripture, that's His grace of reassurance in your life. You can experience whatever will come down the, the pike. The whole of society may crumble and things may look totally different than they did 10 years ago. But you know this, there's someone who's not different. He is the sovereign, unchanging God of the universe. And he says, I do not change, you sons of Jacob. Therefore, you are not consumed. He says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you can be reassured by the grace of God because He has not left us here forever. He will return. And if we leave first, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians that the dead in Christ later will rise first. And then we'll, those who remain will be caught up in the air. They will be changed. And I love what he says. He says, you comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. How do we respond? And I'll be finished. Back to verse 16. Don't grow weary in doing good. I don't know about you, but I've got a confession to make. Through this virus, I've grown weary in doing good at times. I thought, is it making a difference? Is it, is it, it seems like everything's still on time out. No matter where you are on what you believe, it just seems like life is paralyzed, but God's not paralyzed. Be reassured by the grace of God today. Secondly, be lovingly concerned and graciously confrontational, confrontational with disobedient brothers and sisters. And he says that. Look, if they don't heed this, go, go, don't treat them as an enemy, but go lovingly warn them as a brother. You know, during this time, we ought to deepen our relationships with our church member friends, the body of Christ. And we ought to be able to say, hey, are you living for Christ? Or look, I'm concerned about you. And we ought to be loving and we ought to think, that part of God's grace is developing through the church a disciplined membership, a disciplined life in your life. As Josh mentioned, God is using these things to make you who you ought to be. And the author of Hebrews says, if you be without chastisement as all are partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. And here's the last thing. Not only don't grow weary in doing good and be lovingly concerned and graciously uh, confrontational with disobedient brothers and sisters. But here's one, trust the Lord and be at peace. Can you trust him? May I ask you, has he really ever let you down? I want you to think about if someone comes on the news tonight and says America's been attacked or there's another virus or I mean just the most abysmal news you can conceive of. I want to tell you right now as your pastor, you will still have the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. 
God will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be with you even unto the end of the age, Jesus said. Oh, and I want to tell you, there's a, a word, an incorruptible word. It's the inerrant, infallible word of God. It is the miracle of Holy Scripture. And your Bible will remain true and unchanged. And you can still go to the book for the answers of life. We're talking about missions. There are some places where great, great sacrifice and risk of imprisonment and life would be given for one page of that holy book. And then finally, no matter what comes on the news tonight, no matter what news we get, it may get bad, folks, but he has not appointed us under wrath. Jesus is coming back, the message of his second coming. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you feel reassured today? Isn't God good all the time? And all the time, God is good? I'm telling you, don't we need to wake up to the truth of the Word of God more? Don't we need to recapture the wonder of the truth of the Word of God? And no, be reassured because there is a God who has dealt with you not by works, not by your value, but by his amazing grace. Yes. Have you experienced that in your life? Yes. How do you experience God's grace initially? You understand, as Paul said, you don't get to heaven by works of righteousness which, that you do. But it's by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That means the Spirit of God cleanses you. And he raises you to life to be a new person. That's because of nothing you've done. It's his grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. And it is available to all. How do you get that? You trust Jesus Christ. His blood sacrifice on the cross alone for your salvation. You, you know why there's so many people that you might know that say, well, I know I'm going to heaven. Some of them might say that and they might be on their way to hell. But I want to tell you why the people say that that are correct. John wrote, these things I've written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You know why we can know we have eternal life? Because we're not trusting how well we've lived or what we've achieved or some religious ritual through which we have gone. But we are trusting the finished work of Jesus. And that's why Paul said, Therefore you have been justified by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we have peace with God. If you don't have peace with God, if you've never been born again, in just a second we're going to sing. The instrumentalists are coming now at this time. We're going to have an old-fashioned invitation. I'll have a couple of pastors up here, and you just say, hey, I want to go talk to someone. We'll socially distance. We'll wear a mask. I want to go talk to someone. I want to get this matter of my salvation settled today. I want to know that I know that I know that if I were to die, I would go to heaven. You step out and come. Others of you might say, I, I want to join this church, or I know I'm saved. I've given my life to Jesus in repentance and faith. I, I've told him I'm sorry for my sin, and I've given him my life in, in simple faith. But I need to make that public, and I need to be identified with Jesus through baptism. And we'll talk with you about when we can do that at a, a future date. You come. Other believers may just want to come and pray or recommit their lives. There could be someone here. And through this testimony you've heard today, God has called you to full-time vocational missions. Or he's called you to take one step and, and do a short-term mission. And you, you want to say, church, pray for me. I'm, I don't know what I'm getting into, but I'm surrendering to the one I know, Jesus Christ, however he wants to use me. Just like Josh, there's some uncertainty, but I'm stepping out on faith. I know God is calling me.